I'd like to announce the presentation of Dr. Iskert from Kodrach. He's a real asset to this event because he is somebody who really knows his Clausewitz, and he also tries to transfer what he learned from Clausewitz to other spheres of life. And he doesn't do it in a way that is so normal and customary in the private economy that he tries to semantically uh, bend Clausewitz uh, to adapt it to medicine, surgery, continuation of medicine with different means. Well, it's not as simple as that, of course, but he tries to capture the essence of Clausewitz in terms of the meaning, and he's got really a pioneering approach, so I'm very pleased that he's giving a lecture here. And another objective of this conference is that in the German language area, there are really very powerful think tanks that deal with strategic thinking, and one of them is the Clausewitz Network on Strategic Studies, which is a communicating vessel with the Clausewitz Society. So both presenters are here today, once in the form of Iskat von Kodovic, the Clausewitz Network, and General Hermann, who will be giving a lecture in the cyber panel the president of the much bigger Clausewitz Society. And I believe it's important that these think tanks should deal with the strategic thinking also as a communicating vessel with our friends to make sure that we bundle this strategic thinking like in a large family. Iska, could I like ask you for your lecture? Of course, you don't have to ask me twice. Thank you very much for this really wonderful introduction. If uh, you think in terms of perspective, the think tank, you also have to have the courage to fail. This is the motto of my presentation, which is an experimental presentation. You are called upon as the audience to stretch the limits of your tolerance try to bridge humanity, science, and also a mix of the two. So you will be challenged in terms of uh, what you can tolerate, but I know you will, so I guess that uh, you can stomach quite a lot. So the will in the physical model of human forces. So I'd like to give you an idea that we have developed in terms of what human forces mean. Now, this is the emblem and the motto of the Staff Academy of the Bundeswehr, Mens Agitat Molem, Mind Moves Matter. So this is actually the point that I'm trying to come to. That's the essence of my presentation. It's a metaphysical concept, but even if you talk to task force soldiers and asked one of them, a huge guy, really athletic, big and strong. And I said, wow, you're quite a strong guy, strapping. And he said, yes, but others are strong too. But what differentiates us from the other strong guys is what happens up here, the mind. So I believe that wherever we are called upon to perform a total where we are faced with challenges, this uh, mental element is key mind moves matter. And I think we need also the ability to speak about it and to know what it is that I want to achieve. I can't answer the question, what are human forces or strengths? But the question I would like to address is, what would be a more precise notion of the idea of human strengths? Because when we talk about human strengths, even if we are talking about this at the metaphysical level, we need the right terminology. And based on what uh, uh, the research that I've done, these terms are used throughout, but never in a model or in a concept, in a holistic way. This is due to the fact that we have a positivistic uh, uh, well, obligation to remain silent, because what we can't talk about, we have to remain silent about, as Wittgenstein said. But that's actually stupid, because we always talk about what we should remain silent about from a positivist point of view. But we have failed to deal with metaphysical questions. And 
the requirements for this model are the following. I try to come up with all of the human strengths and forces, and I try to bring them in a system without any contradiction. And I think it's important that there should be no contradiction in terms of uh, scientific or biologic findings. And we should also be able to combine it with sociological and psychological models. That's another criterion. So of course, uh, apart from Clausewitz and Kant, we are going to orient ourselves uh, based on the classics. <clears throat> now, how did I come to well, develop this model of uh, physical forces, the context of discovery. I work very intensively with the question of what a means and strategy how to the work. So I have come up with a taxonomy, a list of uh, all the conceivable means of a material and a personal kind that can be used in strategy. But I found in this endless and laborious search for materials and means is that at the end, every material in this men's agitat modem, mind moves matter, uh, this only works if people actually use it and use it actively. And the way this is done is in the form of the intention of using it and the action during use and the attitude towards the means and the use and the ability to adapt and learn during use. So these are the four dimensions how you can use means. And then I have tried to find human forces that describe this. And in metaphysics, I couldn't find anything useful. So I will not uh, bore you with the details. And in my desperation, I dealt with the question, what are forces? Who knows about things? Well, it's the physicists. And then I started to do research. How many forces are there in physics? There are four fundamental forces, just as many as uh, you uh, have uh, thought about. That's gravitation, the electromagnetic force. The gravi gravity is the weakest force, uh, attraction between large masses, electromagnetic force. That's uh, what uh, is the basis of muscle contraction, thinking, muscle contraction, chemical reactions, explosions. It's all electromagnetic forces. And all of that is electromagnetic forces. The strong and the weak nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is the strongest force there is in nature. The good thing is that it's extremely strong, but it's uh, shielded, so it never becomes active except in the nucleus itself. And if it is released, we have the nuclear meltdown. And these are the things that we want to have. And the weak nuclear force is the force of the transformation that occurs in the nucleus. So this is the idea that I have now tried to <coughs> transfer to man. So man has four fundamental elementary forces. So one is the attraction that we have for other people. Then there's the force of consciousness and action, that's the electromagnetic force. Then there's the nuclear force of the character, that's the core, the nucleus, that's the elemental force that people have to offer. There's nothing stronger than that. And there's the ability to change our character, our core, which is a painful and laborious process an extreme force, but not as strong as the strong nuclear force. So it's the weak nuclear force. So that, of course, uh, is nonsense at the humanities level, what I'm doing. But still, let us pursue this approach. What I'm going to do now is I will, little by little, describe the architecture of my idea. And it is not like a painter that I can show to you that it's about this uh, strong energy that I'm talking about, how uh, enormous this energy is. Because I would like to show you the architecture step by step in a very shoddy and rather intuitive and chaotic way. But I can't really uh, talk about what this means and what the implications are. I hope that you're going to listen carefully, and I hope that 
during the discussion, we can really exchange about these ideas. Now, what are the prior notions of this physical model? That's the most strenuous part, then it's going to get easier. Okay, so this is mens agitat olem, so mind rules over matter, mind moves matter, so that's the awareness, the mental dimension. Then there's the organic level that I, as a physician, of course, deal with a lot. The problem in medicine is that we are only dealing with the organic stuff, and we tend to forget the conscious, the consciousness level. So in biosciences, we're never talking about consciousness, and everything that I'll talk about uh, in terms of forces, of course, will always be at the level of uh, the organic dimension. I don't believe in uh, uh, independent mind dissolved from the body, so I'm fully convinced that uh, when your brain dies, your consciousness is gone, so I don't believe that there's a spirit, so I'm a monist in that respect. But this purely organic approach will not lead us to the question of the forces of man. And below that, there's the level of the physical forces. And we can learn from that level about metaphysical forces. What I'm trying to say is that if we ask the question, what are forces in man, I believe that we need to take a physical approach. So we need to differentiate between which two elements are there forces. So in physics, we have particles, particles of matter. And forces act between these particles. Well, how do these forces happen? Through particles that are exchanged. Hume said that, well, we can't really know about the rest. But modern physics, or metaphysics, I would have said, has recognized that uh, the effect between two um, uh, objects happens through a particle that is exchanged between the two. So in this model, we'll try to always indicate what this uh, putative mass element is and what the force is that acts between those two objects. So this means a specificity and a description of these forces. In human forces, I'm talking about potencies. So that's uh, an homage to Clausewitz. It's a metaphysical concept. And between these potencies, there are forces. And I'm talking about mind, soul, and body. Not in the material, organic sense, but in terms of consciousness and identity. I have an awareness of my body. I'm conscious of my body. When I feel pain, that's uh, a consciousness and awareness. It's nothing organic. Of course, there are organic correlates, but no more than that. So we have an awareness of our soul, of our emotions. So the description of what happens at the organic level is not really important. I'm not thinking, oh, I have catecholamine in the blood. No, we excite it. So the emotional dimension and the spiritual dimension is separated here. and. This takes us to what we're actually talking about. So the physical model of human forces states the following. The core forces, the nuclear forces, the strong and the weak electromagnetic force. And in my nomenclature, that is the core capacity of people. So that's basically what makes for the strength, the permanence, and the mutability of character. But that's the core. It's like Freud, that's the subconscious. It's not accessible. It is shielded from us. But still, there is correspondence to our consciousness. The vital capacities, the active sphere, that what makes our consciousness and our action. And then there's also signals capacity. So that's the sum of all the impressions that we are Oh, the signals we are sending to our fellow human beings, that's what makes our attraction. And you can also show this in a systematic manner. And you see the basic potencies. So what's available in the nucleus of our character that's not accessible for cognitive will-based action. What's available is only a small fraction that I call the vital capacity, the vital capacity that is subject to electromagnetic forces and we have a little bit of control about the signals we are sending out. Okay, 
That has been strenuous. It's going to get a little bit more strenuous even. Here are the forces, the strong core or nuclear force, the primitive force, the strongest force there is. And that has an interaction between protons and neutron forces. I will explain that in a minute. And the uh, exchange particles are moving back and forth. The weak nuclear force is the ability for transformation in the core. It is weaker, but it's the second strongest force. Then there's the electromagnetic force. That's what happens in the consciousness and the will. And the attraction force, the gravity force, is the weakest one. So it's not as complicated as that after all. Now let me talk about these four forces and I'll try to explain them in detail. So we have those four forces. And I try to indicate in red what we're talking about so that you have a visual landmark. We are talking about uh, the strong nuclear force. We have neutronic potencies and forces. So that's all of the uh, of your nature and nurture. So in psychology, we know that 50% of what makes your personality is genetically predetermined, and 50% is shaped by the environment. Twin studies and other studies have shown that. So that is the basic inventory. That's what we have. Makeup, our structure, and our skills. So at the physical level, that's the way we look. The ability for homeostasis self-regulation, self-preservation, but also things such as health and illness. At the emotional level, it's our instincts, emotions, the temperament, the character, all of these things are laid down. We know this from personality studies. So how extroverted you are, how neurotic, how controlled or uncontrolled. So those are basic pillars, the structural potencies, the core or nuclear character. And at the spiritual level, the ability to think, our cognitive skills, our cognition, neural plasticity, and the speed of thinking. So is somebody, uh, in terms of his structural agency, is he capable of thinking fast and in an agile manner or not? So those are things that we know about. That's the concept of intelligence. So we know that this is basically your genetic makeup. And then there's competencies, uh, strength, speed, endurance, and things that can be trained for and that are also in enduring. And then emotional skills, empathy, intuition, ability to enforce your will, ability to engage in relationships. And then intelligence, openness, and creativity. These are cognitive competencies. Now, in the protonic potencies, we determine two basic things. On the one hand, are basically protonic uh, competencies or skills are what uh, man has due to his genetic makeup and what urges him to communicate with the outside world. So let's say there are certain urges, instincts, and drives that are necessary by nature and orient us towards the outside. So that's on the one hand, that's our needs, our urges. If you're hungry, you go out and you go hunting. So that's an urge, very strong protonic force. There's physical needs, hunger, thirst, security, insecurity, heat, security, sleep. And the emotional dimensions, that's social wishes, recognition, power, in intimacy. And at the mental level, it's spiritual hopes, curiosity, the need for clarity, the need for truth, the urge to ask questions, this mental seeking, this quest. These are elemental human needs. When it comes to what makes us attractive, as a person or what uh, makes us try for something. The striving, well, there are material values that are strive for stimulation, excitement, performance, achievement, interest in things. In the social and emotional dimension, it's friendship, significance, love, conformity, traditionalism, 
interest in other people. And at the spiritual, mental level, these are abstract values, universal values, wisdom, freedom, tolerance, justice, and self-determination, freedom, independence, creativity, interest in ideas. So the protonic forces urge us in two ways to go to the outside world, as a need, as a constraint, and also because we're interested in the world. And like I said, we can split this up, and I believe that this will give us a complete list. Now, these protonic forces determine how we relate to the outside world and how we act on it. This is an interaction between protonic and neutronic forces. So we can achieve a nuclear balance or equilibrium. I'm not really going to go into detail because this hasn't been fully worked out, but here you see how you relate to yourself and how you relate to the outside world. And this is seen as a balance or imbalance, and thus you can determine about the stability or instability of a character and a personality. And you can describe it in a very elegant manner. The weak nuclear force, as I said, is the ability to change on the inside, these neutronic or protonic change. And here differentiate between two forms. There's an internally driven change, change that comes from within, that is described by the ability to grow, mature, and age. And if you look at this in psychology, these are essential processes that are highly important in order to systematically describe how people change over time. This is trivial but important. We do this at a physical level and at the emotional level. We know that the development of children is happening through psychological stages, the cognitive development, the plasticity, and there's also dementia in the end, where you lose your skills gradually. So all of that is driven from within. That's the neutronic transformation processes that are highly relevant. Now, on the external level, there are also such uh, processes. The physical transformation happens through training, drill, and there's also well, enhancers, pharmacological enhancers or illnesses. The emotional dimension, where there's emotional learning, experience, conditioning, this is uh, what causes this transformation. At the level of consciousness, it is learning, learning experience, uh, education, and also losing knowledge. So these are important factors that bring about inner change. Now, let's take a look at the protonic dimension. This is a lot more interesting because everything that happens in drama, so characters are shaken by disappointment or by uh, serious incisive events, events that shape us, that impress us, either in a positive or in a negative way. So all of these things are external transformations that uh, drama deals with and also well, personality studies deal with. So this dimension is important in order to help us understand a character. So is somebody ready to learn, to make emotional experiences, education sentimentale, and the like. So this is an extremely important dimension. And here, too, when it comes to the protonic forces, we have internal drivers, where a process of maturing plays a key role. But there's also the ability of people to change at a fundamental level to deep learning. So the electromagnetic force, that's more or less the consciousness, the empirical and the normative consciousness, the empirical consciousness, well, this is how my body is structured, that's how people are, this is how my mind is, that's how life is. And the reflection, the ability to control and to have a long-term programming. So the question for the actual action and recommendation and the ability of people to program themselves to develop uh, uh, styles of thinking or acting. 
Uh, the will in this concept is only the ability to act, to feel, to think, and to thus maintain a certain intensity or uh, to even enhance it. So I have uh, constructed this in a kybernetic way. So the will is the ability to either uh, reinforce or attenuate your thinking or your striving. And you see that the outcome at the putative theoretical level is the final result of an action of a striving. And that depends substantially on the will. And this is how I use will and no other way. The other thing is uh, consciousness and the reflective force. So this force of attraction is a bit nebulous, but I tried to work this up for you. When it comes to the laws of attraction and physics and gravity, well, maybe I was <clears throat> a bit misled, but I posit that we only have the force of gravity, the only force of attraction, not the opposite. But there's a positive and a negative attraction. I have posited this at the theoretical level, but I think that's how it is. Let's t start with negative attraction, horror movies of crime stories or whatever. So this is negative attraction. And this negative attraction that exerts a strong pull on the soul. This is called fascination. So uh, horror, terror, and uh, the fascination with it, that's negative attraction. But of course, there's also a negative attraction that is conditioned by imperfection and ugliness. And Beautiful people, on the one hand, have a, a level of perfection, but actually, if there is a slight imperfection, that's what really makes people beautiful. So there's this beauty spot, a mole on your cheek or whatever. So this is uh, the ugly things that can also be very attractive. So that should be considered as well. And there's also a negative attraction at the mental, spiritual level. Things that are enigmatic, thing, well, ideas that uh, stri make you strive even more, or things that uh, don't work, or that failure. All of this is a challenge. It requires you to either rethink or to continue even more intensively. That's negative attraction. And you can also convey this to other people. If you fail here, that's a negative attraction for them. But then you think you know how to do it properly. And that has a certain pull, if you like it or not. And then, of course, physical signals, attractiveness, um, emotional attachment. So what's very important, of course, is rhetoric skills. That means that you are able to convince other people, intellectual signals, uh, uh, providing proof. Well, no need for me to uh, summarize things because uh, I only have five minutes left for a Q&A session. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Wolfgang, am I allowed to answer questions? Yes, someone raised their hand. Two generals, please. Now, let me refer to an issue that's quite important, will and the expression of will in politics and strategic matters. How can it be shaped? Now, in Germany, our politicians tend to focus on the media. In Austria, it may be different. So my question to you is quite specific. Politicians have the will to do new things, to be visionaries, and to be innovative. And where do they repress things in order to enforce their policies? How do they go about things? Thank you. Well, I don't want to talk about how they do it, but how they could do it. The question how they could do it is the very reason why I've developed these uh, concepts. And thanks for this essential question. That's what I wanted to show when showing the Vanguard Church to you. 
So what's the significance? What I want to say is the following. In human beings, we've got forces within their character that are very, very powerful. Now, if we were to transfer this model to the forces, we could actually uh, generate nuclear a nuclear meltdown, collectively, not individually. But what we have to do, and this is what I make the case for, we have to target these forces. If we fail to do this, politics will fail. We are a democracy. We can't do what we want to do. We can't just move about in elitist circles and then criticize citizens if they don't like what we offer to them. We have to target these forces. And as soon as we unleash them, and it's not difficult to do that, it's possible, then we will emerge victorious. We can do what we want to do. Of course, we are responsible human beings, so of course we have to set limits ourselves. Van Gogh's church moved me a lot. I saw it somewhere when I was waiting for someone or something, and I said, this is full of energy. That's what I said to myself. You know, there is a hustle and bustle of energy. That also applies to human beings. If we're unable to tap these sources that are always there, if we just ignore them, that would be stupid. Now, there is a, a book that is actually quite interesting. There is um, a young guy who, according to this book, went to the emperor and said, I want to become a samurai. And everyone said, well, you're stupid. And then the emperor asked him a question. He says, well, are you ready to follow me? And the young man says, yes. And that brings me back to the issue of will. Now, it may actually also be someone who's not trained, but if they have the ability to focus on their nuclear force and to actually utilize it, well, then they are ready. And that's what I do with my students as well. So if I found something in those students, this will to do something, then I know that I can do whatever I want to do with that person. So you've actually put the right question. And that's, I think, why some politicians fail. Now, I don't want to sing the praise of charisma. I don't want to do this. But just look at people like Mandela, who has a lot of um, attractiveness who radiates. Oscar Wilde at one point said that it's the personality and not the principles that determine our lives. Well, personalities, of course, are very much shaped by principles, too. That's what I posit. So I uh, disregard the good and evil dichotomy. But I think that the forces of human beings could be plotted along an axis, and that unleashes certain powers. Well, this was a fascinating presentation. Now, over the past few years, there have been discussions about automated systems, autonomous systems, robotics, and so on and so forth. Wouldn't it be reasonable, according to you, and many people, of course, are afraid that these systems will make humans obsolete, including uh, armed forces? Well, wouldn't it be uh, talk about human force enhancement and to come up with a comparative study? So from the criteria that you listed, what of these human forces, which one of these human forces can actually be used by artificial systems? Where are the limits and where are the opportunities that you see? Well, that's, of course, the next logical question. Thank you for putting this question to me. As a physician, I've dealt with artificial intelligence and other areas. Well, there's a clear-cut position that I have. As physicians, as doctors, we need to accept whatever enhances our capabilities. That's what we owe to our patients. That is true for the military sphere and the medical sphere and many other areas as well. There are always some risks and side effects while well, we have to think about them as well. But then, of course, there are opportunities that arise from artificial intelligence. Now, technologically speaking, there is a fair amount of fetishism, but we should bid farewell to that. 
So, there shouldn't be technological perfection. That's not the ultimate goal. Really, we should focus on elementary skills and capabilities. Now, emotional skills, that's something that AI will not really be able to achieve. Well, we have to be cautious here, and um, we shouldn't um, anticipate things. We shouldn't compare ourselves to robots. That's not meaningful. But we should focus on our basic skills. We'd better do this, because uh, they really are what uh, makes us up as human beings. So we've seen a technological hype over the past 150 years, and now we have to revert to human beings and their archaic, basic skills and capabilities. And that's really a problem besetting our current age. There is a fair amount of um, technology and red tape and societal technology, if you like, and we've lost our souls in the process. And that's why we're facing a challenge. We need to come back to humanism, to humanity. I've got a question relating to the model. You talked about gravitation and positive and negative force of attraction. Now, I'm sure that there's also a third element, and that's a force of rejection, natural force of rejection. And that, of course, um, doesn't make us scared. It's natural forces of rejection. And I think that somewhere you need to uh, consider this. Well, yes, I've given this a lot of thought, of course. Now, when it comes to attraction, I'm not really sure if I've taken the right approach. Now, who believes that we also have a force of rejection? Just raise your hands if you think that there is this force of rejection. Well, some of you have raised their hands. Well, thanks for um, involving the audience and stimulating the uh, uh, audience as well. But unfortunately, as the moderator, I have to put an end to this because we've got the uh, plenary discussion relating to cyber issues a bit later. But feel free to put uh, questions to the speaker bilaterally during coffee breaks. And we'll continue this uh, very interesting discussion a bit later. Thank you. 8.40. Well, at 8.50, we'll um, come to the issue of Armenia. So why don't we stretch our legs? And then we will continue at 8.50, 10-minute break. Thank you.